right. What happened to Ronnie? Did we? Um... Hi, Megan from the Bay Area. We're from the Bay Area too. <laughs> it's finally sunny. <laughs> but cold. Yes, nice and crispy. Um, Sam, we are recording, but uh, Megan had asked whether we were recording this as a webinar or whether we were recording it uh, as a regular Zoom chat. And I don't know if there's a difference and maybe we should have figured that out. But if you or Samantha wanted to ch personal chat, um, Kelsey, if that's a if that's a concern. Yes. Hello, Elaine. Hello. I just read a great book that took place in Chinatown. It was amazing. It's called Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers. Highly recommend. Very chaotic. All right, let's give just a couple more minutes for people to come in. We're recording today. Um, if you've um if you're just joining us, drop where you're joining us from, your name in the chat. Um, at any point during today's uh, webinar, feel free to drop any questions in the chat that you may have for Carol. We'll be doing like a QA and a portion towards the end of the webinar, and I'll be monitoring the chat. Yeah. Hopefully everyone's having a nice... Friday. And I am sending an email to Ronnie just in case we lost her. I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, she is coming. Oh, in there now. she is. Good. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining Hello, us. Anna, I, mean, I was ahead, gonna girl. say to Anna Mammoth, oh my gosh, wow, it must be amazing up there. <laughs> it's been wild, that's for sure. <laughs> my goodness. I hope you're doing okay though, and the kids too. Thank you. They've had a lot of snow days. <laughs> Honestly, I'm very jealous. I never got snow days as a kid. One day, the water main at my school broke, and that was the closest we got. <laughs> awesome. Well, should we kick this off? Hello, everybody. Welcome. So happy to have everybody here with us. We're recording today's event. Um, but so we ask you to mute your audio for the speakers, but feel free to put any questions into the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout. So I'll keep an eye on those and we'll be doing a Q&A portion later on. So yeah, thanks for everybody for joining us. I'm Kelsey Holtaway from the Children's Creativity Museum in San Francisco. I work on our various network efforts, including the Lego Playful Learning Network, which you'll learn a little bit more about today, and the National Girls Collaboration Project, among some other things. Um, I'm very excited today for our conversation about the power of play, which comes natural to kids and out-of-school time educators, as you all know. And research across youth development and education fields have identified principles that define playful learning. Gosh, I thought I was doing so naturally with my lines. Oh, there we go. And positive youth outcomes that can come from intentional play. So in this webinar, we'll explore 
this topic and learn about free resources that you can use to incorporate high quality, playful learning opportunities into your programs and also how to advocate for more play in the lives of children. Once again, feel free to drop any questions you may have into the chat. I'm now thrilled to introduce Dr. Carol Tang from the Children's Creativity Museum, our speaker for today's webinar about nurturing creativity and social emotional learning through play. Dr. Carol Tang is the executive director of the Children's Creativity Museum and a member of the Lego Playful Learning Museum Network. Dr. Tang is also a board member of the How Kids Learn Foundation and the Association of Children's Museums. She previously led the coalition of science after school and was program officer at the SD Bechdel Foundation where she oversaw after school funding. Carol, take us away. Hello, everyone. Um, good to see Working some in. familiar organizations and folks uh, on the call today. And I know it's spring break. So um, thank you all for coming today. And I know some of the people who registered and all of you uh, look forward to seeing the um, the recording and also the PowerPoint, which we will share as well. So um, we are going to spend some time talking about the importance of play, some of the research uh, based um, strategies we can employ, and then we'll have time for all of you to share because I know that all of us have expertise either as kids when we were kids with as parents aunts and uncles and also in our professional work as well so we want to um, be able to inspire all of you to uh, share some of your thoughts either um, by unmuting uh, and speaking uh, or putting into chat but you know we all know the best professional development is when you think about how this presentation will actually um, give you something that you can do tomorrow you know and so that's what we're hoping to do by the end of our webinar today and again, I have some QR codes. If you want to get your phone ready, uh, there's a few places you can download free things. But then again, Temescal and How Kids Learn, and we will all follow up with links with resources and the PowerPoint as well. So thanks again for coming today. Um, so we are going to start with a um, with a uh, icebreaker. And Kelsey has put it in the jam board if you are uh, able to... Um, access the Jamboard, which is there. And Kelsey, are you able to, I can um, yes. admit people while you do oh, that. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So if everyone can click on the link that I just dropped in the chat, it's a fun and not, oh, share. I'm changing the restrictions. Hold on. Okay, thank you so much, Anna and Megan. Okay, you can try that Jamboard link. Hopefully that should let you in. Is that everybody getting in with that one? Awesome. Yes. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm actually, if you go to the, um, the Jamboard, we are going to be building a forest together. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a bunch of different, um, like a toolbar. And the things that you can utilize the most are where it says add image. And then at the very top, the pen, you can change the pen to be different things like markers. And you can add what you want to the forest. So you can see I'm adding grass right now. That's like not perfect, but that doesn't matter. We don't need it to be perfect. Um, yeah, so we're all gonna create a forest together. I'm gonna give us a few minutes. Let me know if you have any questions with functionality, um, but you can- I think we're in, sorry, we're in view mode only. So we aren't able to edit and we don't have the icons to add. Genius of me. Thank you again. Okay. You should all have full sharing capabilities now. <laughs> okay. Does everyone have access to edit now? Yes. Awesome. So sorry about that. Thanks for your patience. Um, yeah, so you can add images, um, you can search for trees or animals, or you could draw things, but ultimately let loose and let's build a community garden together. I'll give us until 10, 11. 
sein. All right, we'll put our finishing touches on our beautiful forest. I love the colors. Thank you to the person who finished out the grass since I only did half of it. Love the teamwork on that. Um, I love the bird flying amongst the beautiful blue sky. This is so satisfying. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. All right, Carol, it's all you now. Thank you. Um, so thank you for participating in the jam board. And this is something obviously you could do even for your virtual. Um, but this is one thing as like a as um Kelsey mentioned, you know, we are part of this uh launch of a Lego playful learning network, museum network. And one of the things that Lego does in their own foundation and in their own corporation is always start with something uh, fun um, to remind them of their mission. And that kind of reminds me of, you know, what after school and children's museums do. You know, we have to remind ourselves that's not all about um, 
you know, selling tickets and about, you know, keeping a track of, uh, you know, people's time cards and things like that, that there's, you know, fun and laughs as part of our work. And so Lego is actually creating um, a bunch of like icebreakers for meetings and they make all their executives do this every time. And because it's important, they feel like um, not just because it's their mission, but every corporation, every organization that if they incorporate a little bit more play, they would actually be more productive and they would be more creative. Um, and have more teamwork and more communication and more connection between people. And clearly we're doing a webinar, but you know, this is what we've all learned after three years of the pandemic, that whether you're online or in person, making those personal connections is what makes you feel valued, what your work is productive. Uh, this is why you get up in the mornings, uh, it, maybe even if you don't get dressed and you're in pajamas, you know, it, but it is the fun and personal connection that makes a difference. And so that's why we want to start it out with an iceberg Worker. So uh, we've even done some karaoke songs um, or emoji karaoke with uh, Lego Foundation executives, for example, as part of um, our network there. So today I'm not going to focus specifically on Lego or the Lego network, but really think a little bit about, you know, what are the kinds of things that we do and what's the lessons that they, as well as other researchers, um, have uh, created for us to be able to do our work. So we're going to start with a quick poll. I, I, I'm afraid I'm challenging Kelsey with the tech today and all of you as well, but if you could put up the first poll. And so the poll is, have you received any previous professional development around play specifically? Yes or no? So we can, uh, we have most of the people have responded already. Um, we'll go ahead and end the poll um, because it's exactly 50 50 right now. Um, so right now, um, we have 50% of people said yes, and 50% of the people said no. Um, and so hopefully some of this will be a refresher or with new uh, data for you. And then again, a reminder that, um, that this is a kind of uh, intentionality that we just all just continue to bring to our work. And then half people have not had specific training around play. And again, many of you have had training around lots of things that are probably relevant to play, but hopefully I'll give you an inspiration to actually use the word play in terms of the work that we do. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about, you know, go into the content then. And again, as we talked about, go ahead and put questions in the chat or observations or your experience. We're happy to have everybody have a conversation today. So the UN Commission on Human Rights has already said that play is a fundamental right of every child. And yet, um, that's not what we actually see in real life. And these are some poll results from before the pandemic. And I don't know how the pandemic has affected things. Um, but one is the fact that um, in, in just a very short amount of time, um, American children have just lost more and more hours a week for play. And in fact, in 2017, 18% of children said that they have less than two hours of play per week. And maybe we as parents don't think that's necessarily the case. We see them playing around, you know, we think that counts. But these are what kids are self-reporting as playtime. And that means that, you know, they don't necessarily feel that, you know, some of the other things that they're doing, you know, running errands and things like that is play. And yet we as adults can put play, playful learning in all these interstitial times as well. We can also advocate the fact that we should have more time for play for all children. Uh, one in five children say they're too busy to play. And I think really heartbreaking as well as 49% of parents say that they do not have enough time to play with their children. So again, some of that work then burden comes to our shoulders as after school professionals, as museum professionals, as educators, that we might have to put in enough time for play and also to find ways to encourage parents to have more time or find, you know, finding those spaces for play for their children. 
And I think most troubling, in fact, is the socioeconomic play gap. So that um, they asked this question, I play with blocks, children in many nations around the country. And average in every country, there's a 20% gap. There's 20% more wealthy children who say they play with blocks than children who come from poor and impoverished backgrounds. And that's an average. So there are countries where that gap is much greater. Children from so for higher socioeconomic families were also 10% more likely across the world to say that they engaged in all, any type of play. And then uh, more bad news. So schools in America where there's over 75% free or reduced lunch, students who qualify for 75% free or reduced lunches um, report the least amount of time for recess. As you know, in the last few years, we've talked about academic success, we've talked about academic achievement, how important it is um, for kids to be able to be set up for academics um, beyond school, beyond K-12, so college or vocational or jobs. Um, and that means that sometimes we take away from or take recess away um, because we feel like some of those other needs are more important. As we know, impoverished urban neighborhoods have the least access to open space and safe playgrounds where you can have play. And then low income families report the least amount of time for free play for their children. And that actually is worrisome. In fact, some of the earliest long term studies about the benefits of play came from um, World Bank and World Economic Forum, where they're looking at the development of children in various countries and looking at what are the interventions that really help kids succeed in the future. And some of those studies show that when you helped a family, not just with food and medicine, but you help them with play, with uh, toys, with guided play, somebody who came and actually uh, coached parents on how to play, those kids had better economic outputs and longer lives and healthier lives, even 20 years after that intervention. And so some of the earliest long-term studies were done by economists who you don't think they care about play. And yet they're the ones who've been sort of raising the red flag and saying that there is a global play gap between wealthy, affluent families and low-income families. And this actually has long-term reper repercussions, not just for those children, not just for those families, but for whole societies and whole countries and our economic future. So this is not just for fun. So today we're gonna to be part of the solution of all that. We're gonna to try to figure out ways to insert play into many of the activities we already do or to create more space for play and then also how to talk about it so that parents and other educators and other organizations can get on this play movement so we can help all kids have more play time, but then also, especially the ones who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, from underserved and under-resourced situations where they could benefit the most from playful learning. So we'll talk about what is play, what are some of the positive youth outcomes, including social emotional learning and creativity, the soft skills, the non-academic skills, for example, well, we already talked a little bit about the play gap and the inequities. We'll talk about some ways of looking at the principles of playful learning that we could then sort of use and use as a checklist for all of our activities. Did we do this? Did we do this? Can we do better on this aspect of playful learning? We'll talk about the strategies and that includes all of you talking about how you've thought about play and either again at home, in your own personal lives, in your own childhood or in your work environment. So first of all, I think one of the complications of what is play for someone who's not trained in child psychology or child development is that, boy, it is complicated. So this is a poster that was created in Scotland. There's an organization called Play Scotland, and they created this based on a book called A Play Worker's Taxonomy of Play. And so there's all these different kinds of plays. And, you know, one one is, you know, I recognize that they have Britishisms, you know, so there are things that, you know, maybe we would say a different way, but there's all these different ways of playing. And it makes sense when I look at this. But when I think about how to use this, I get overwhelmed. And in fact, if you do a Google search, which I did uh, last night, types of play, if you type in types of play in Google, these are the questions. What are the seven types of play? What are the six basic types of play? What are the 10 types of play? What are the 16 types of play? And then there's also a whole bunch of search results on the 11 types of play. 
So it is so confusing um, and it can be overwhelming for those of us who are not specialists or researchers or have had a curriculum that already has defined these things. So how are we as, as after school professionals and museum educators, how are we to navigate this? And so I'm hoping to share with you today is not worrying about, you know, is this media play or is this pretend play? You know, don't worry about that. Let's just be child-centered and think about what the child is experiencing and what they could be benefiting from and how we can then um, construct situations that allow them to sort of take advantage of play. And maybe later on, we can figure out what type of play it was. So again, the definition of what is play. So if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, you know, one of the definitions is it's to engage in an activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than a serious or practical purpose. And that might be true for adults, but, you know, even I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. But, you know, I would hope that we would all agree that, you know, the definition is is woefully uh, inaccurate, <laughs> that we really should be just to engage in activity for enjoyment and recreation. And in fact, a quote um, by uh, Fred Rogers um, um, says, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning or serious work. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. So again, one of the things that I'm hoping, and this does come from Lego, and again, um, you know, it's I, I, we share it because we've used it, um, and there's a QR code if you want to get it. It's a free booklet, um, and it has a lot of the um, uh, the research statistics that I'm talking about today. Um, but it's a good way if you're if you need uh, your person to write a grant, for example, you know, it's a great way to get references, for example, to talk about what you do and why it's important, and the research that's um, all already developed around play. As I mentioned, um, child development, uh, developmental psychologists, and now cognitive researchers, people who are understanding how the brain works um, and how we learn through you know, the neurons that grow, have been studying play. So we don't have to get into all this research, um, but we have practices that we can contribute to the discussion about the importance of play. So what the Lego Foundation has done is looked at all, a lot of these papers and studies and actually commissioned some of the studies. And they've come up with uh, sort of a way to look at the benefits of physical, social, cognitive, emotional, and creative. And we can categorize this, and, and I encourage you to download um, the, the book if you wanted to. Um, but what I'm going to do today is actually walk through um, another framework that I think is really important. It's called The Power of Play. And it was developed by the Minnesota Children's Museum, and it is a research summary on play and learning. So again, the QR code is there for you to download um, the publication. And we'll send all these links after the, the webinar. So don't worry too much about your phone and QR readers and things like that. That. We'll send this to you. Um, but this is, uh, again, lots of studies already there. So if you were interested in reading it or you needed you know, to, to justify what you're doing or to write a grant proposal, um, a, a great resource for that. Um, but I'll summarize that and go into a little bit of detail. And what they've decided is that um, there are buckets of um, impacts. These are the youth development um, outcomes, positive outcomes that can come from play. And they have seven powers of play. Um, and I've sort of recategorized them. So they really want to have them all seized because then it's, you know, very clean. And so they uh, use self-control and put self into parentheses. Um, so, you know, so it's seven C's of uh, the powers of play. Um, so, and I'll go through some of these and I've bucketed some of these um, and so we can talk about them together. Um, the first one is coordination. And that means really sort of the physical outcomes um, that come from play. So I think a lot of times we think of play and we think about, well, you know, playing tag or playing on the playground. And that's clearly one of the powers of play that, you know, play allows you for gross motor skills. But I think something that we don't often think about as well is that games, um, for example, are a great way to do fine motor skills as well. 
So a lot of times we think about writing or painting or crayons, scissor work as uh, good for sort of fine motor skills. But think about how hard it is to move your characters on uh, on Candyland, or you know how to sort of um, play checkers without knocking over all the all the you know play pieces or the board. You know, there's a lot of coordination actually that goes into. It. Think about like Battleship and how you know you have to put those little tiny pegs into your battleship. So coordination I think again um one thing that we all know we've learned is that you know one of the school readiness um, skills for kids to go into kindergarten now one of the things they're lacking is not understanding how to read ABCs they're not very good at using scissors. And so we have a, a responsibility, but you can do it through play um, and, and just board games and just think of the physical um, control, physical coordination that it takes to just play a simple game. Um, so it doesn't have to be just just running around or balance. It can also be the fine uh, eye mode, eye hand coordination, for example. Some of the other um, pieces then, for example, is, is I bucketed sort of the, the things about self-control and confidence. You know, these are about identity, about executive function, a lot of things that we're talking about in expanded learning. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to talk about is just, you know, red light, green light and, uh, and Simon Says. You know, those have been shown to be um, games and play that actually um, help with executive function. So when you're playing, Simon says, you have to listen carefully. You have to pay attention. You have to pause, you know, and, and, and decide, do I actually, you know, touch my nose or did they really say Simon says? And red light, green light, you know, this, this being poised to run, but stopping as soon as you hear something. That are, those are all practices for self-control. Um, I also talk about those as good coding. So those of you who know me from the Coalition for Science After School and STEM, you know, I think the red light, green light, and Simon Says are perfect for pre-coding computational skills as well. So, so many ways to take something fun and think about it in educational ways and how you layer on the kind of learning that you get. Just from playing a game, you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, force them to do an exercise or a worksheet. You know, they're playing a game, and yet they're they're learning self control or they're learning about pre coding skills, computational skills. Of course, there's also a lot of self control when you lose or win a game. Um, so losing a game um, and being able to manage your own emotion, um, that is, you know, practice for getting into uh, into the real world, into getting the workforce, uh, managing with your peers, with your family members. Um, losing and winning games is really a, a, a big piece of, you know, who we are and our identity and so on. And so self-control, that's where play and games are one way where you can practice this in a low stakes setting. You don't want to learn how to do self-control when you're driving on the freeway and there's road rage. You want to do it when you're playing a game of checkers um, or you're, you know, building a fort and someone knocks something down. You want to be able to learn how to do that in a setting where, um, you can be safe where there are educators and after school professionals to help you do that. Um, and you you learn how to manage and, and how to, uh, to deal with your emotions, for example. And then confidence as well. So your belief in your own abilities to experience success and satisfaction. That confidence comes from, again, having to be in, in low stakes settings, in games and play, where you learn that you're pretty good, you know, where your peers listen to you, or, you know, you are able to build a Jenga uh, tower, you know, where, you know, you, you were able to um, uh, run fastest, or you were the last one to be caught in tag. You know, that confidence sort of shows you um, that you're able able to succeed, you know, what are the kinds of things that it takes to feel success? And then to say, you know, I can do it again, you know, uh, I didn't win the last time, but I'm going to win next time. So all those kinds of things are done in a playful way. Um, and it's so powerful so that kids aren't led into the world and in high stakes settings, where they're, they no longer have these support system to be able to allow them to do this.
So the picture I have here is a young man in our uh, animation studio here at the Children's Creativity Museum. And, you know, to me that this kind of photo, his smile, just how proud he is of this uh, and posing for a photo. But it also, I think, ties into some of the things that we just talked about. So building with Legos is a coordination, again, hand-eye coordination. Um, and sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes things don't turn out the way that you want it to. Um, and also making these stop motion videos, it takes a long time to just do a few seconds, right? So you have to have executive control. You can't, you know, there's no way to speed up that movie. It has to be done frame by frame. And then when you're done, you feel really good about it. So you only created four seconds, but you feel really good about that. And you feel like you could make another four seconds. You could make a movie um, someday if you had enough time. So to me, this photo kind of encapsulates that, you know, with one activity, um, it's not a game, but it's it's play and um, because it's self-directed because he got to choose he it was for enjoyment it was not for a grade um, but he was able to again hand-eye coordination self-control patience executive function and confidence and agency in what he did to continue our tour of the seven powers of play um, we're here we have um, creative thinking and critical thinking so in um, you know, these are the kinds of things, obviously, at, at my museum, we think a lot about for creative uh, thinking um, and how to experiment with alternatives um, without fear. So this is one of the things about being um, when you're out um, in the workforce and they're telling you to be creative or, you know, during the pandemic, when you're trying to figure out how to keep your small business, you know, going, you know, there's a lot of high stakes of being able to generate ideas think about which ideas might work um, and, and sort of execute on them. And so creative thinking, if you are paralyzed with fear because you've never had a chance to do that, you don't wanna do it the first time during a pandemic, for example. You wanna be able to say, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I used to come up with all sorts of solutions. I used to invent you know, how to make a fort with my pillows. I was able to do things there and that gives me the confidence and the agency to, to actually deploy creative thinking in high stakes um, settings as well. Uh, so experimenting with alternatives, thinking some things are going to work out, some things aren't going to work out, but it is actually a skill. It is actually, you know, a muscle, you know, being able to generate lots and lots of options and then to choose which options to pursue. That is a creative thinking and critical thinking. And both of those things are really key for decision making in the world. So doing that during play, during games, when you're inventing a game where you're telling your peers, you know, uh, how to race, you know, where to race. Uh, you know, all those rules in games, um, all those things are, are ways to sort of experiment and then sort of pick through your ideas to figure out what's true and not true. I was also thinking about critical thinking. I know so many of us in after school these days are, are thinking about that. It's just that how do we help kids, you know, navigate uh, TikTok and AI? You know, what is real and what's not real? This, this sort of digital literacy. Um, and it's so important for our democracy, for example. So thinking about, you know, how do we help kids do this? And I was, you know, this isn't something you're going to do with your kids, most likely. Uh, but I was just thinking about the game of poker. You know, that, you know, there are these ways that uh, we, uh, and there's all these bluffing games. If you think about Go Fish, you know, it's this idea that you know, you've got a bunch of hand, cards in your hand. You're trying to figure out who else has the card you need. Everyone's kind of bluffing a little bit, you know, um, and trying to figure out, you know, who has the card I need? You know, what number do they have? If I give this away, will the other person steal it? You know, so thinking about like poker and Go Fish and, um, and you know, those kinds of things, you know, it is this idea. How do you figure out like who's telling the truth? what are the tells, you know, how do I think about the world around me and process the information um, so that I'm critically thinking about, is this true? What's actionable? You know, what's next? What does this mean? Is this information something I should act on? Is this information that's true? Um, those are all things that you can do during games because there are games that are set up to be la that way, you know, that you're kind of, uh, or, you know, clue, for example, where you're trying to find the murder and is it, you know, uh, the, uh, peacock, you know, with a with a candlestick, you know, those are all these ways of thinking about uh, how you process information 
about what's the agenda of someone telling you something, you know, what do they want? What do they need? And what do I want? What do I need? These are all things that can be explored through play um, and uh, in a way that helps kids actually develop skills for the future. And again, we don't normally think of this, you know, we think of this as, okay, this is something in between homework. This is something that, you know, we're doing as a family because it's about family time, but it's actually imparting skills and lessons and um, practices that kids are going to need their whole lives. So then the last set of the power of play that I want to explore is this collaboration and communication. Um, and, and here I have a picture again in our museum where, you know, it takes a little bit of collaboration because what we've done is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is our mystery box challenge where they're trying to create something together. Um, and we never thought about it as play until we looked at what these principles are and said, you know, we do fulfill these, you know, our mystery box challenge, which again, I'll talk a little bit more about and give you some resources is where you have to build something based on a prompt. And, and, you know, this collaboration communication, you can see happening is like, you know, I don't know how to do this. And they brainstorm ideas as creative thinking, of course, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and critical thinking, but it's also like, you know, can you hold this so I can cut this, you know, what, what would you do with this? Um, so collaboration, again, we think a lot about games as, as competition, but there's also collaboration in terms of like making sure you are setting up the rules correctly. So another example I have is Monopoly. You know, when we play Monopoly, you know, there's so many variations, right? You know, uh, can you borrow against this? You know, can you, are you, you know, what happens if you, do you get $50 at, if you land on the parking spot? You know, these are actually collaborative rules, that even though Monopoly is competitive, you're actually setting up these, these guided, you're setting up parameters of the game where you are setting it up for mutual benefit. Um, it's fairness, it's, it's collaboration and communication to decide on the rules of a game. And you're doing that within Monopoly. Think about when kids, you know, invent their own games on the playground, when it's really free play without an adult. You know, they have rules about, you know, this is safe, you know, this is not safe. No, you can't do this. You know, there's so many complicated rules for every game they play. That is a sense of collaboration and communication. And again, we always think about it as competition, but it's actually really hard to set up those rules of the game um, for everyone to then enjoy and play. And that is, is communicating. And that, of course, you can tell is how teams work uh, in the workforce um, or at home when you're na navigating with your roommates, you know, who's going who's gonna to wash the dishes tomorrow, setting up the rules of play, setting up fair rules, um, where people will follow. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can do, again, low stakes in games and play um, that then give you these skills and confidence to do that in the future. So I'm going to pause there and see if anybody has any questions, but we also have a poll. So maybe I'll see if there's, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat right now. But otherwise, Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind putting up the second poll. So the poll is, do you intentionally provide playful learning experiences in your work? So I gave you a sort of all these different ways that you can do that, but are you intentionally providing play, playful learning experiences at your workplace? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll since we have more than half the people. So then, again, not, not surprising at all. What I would expect for after school and, and museum settings is that um, the majority of you um, who answered the poll said that, yes, you're intentionally providing playful learning experiences. Um, and there was one person who said no, and a few people maybe who didn't answer the poll. So we can all do better, even if we are intentionally doing that. Again, is is setting aside time. And also, perhaps you're doing it already, but not um, putting it into this framework that um, uh, that hopefully will be able to allow you to feel more comfortable and confident doing that. And we had a... Um, 
um, in the in the chat. Um, and so there's somebody who's said no, but that's because they're working with uh, kids. And so they're going to try to incorporate it with adults. And so hopefully that is the case. OK, so thank you for that. And uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, so. So one thing then is that, you know, this, this, how, you know, we, there is a play gap and yet we know that play and games um, have so much uh, impact um, for kids. So how do we start a movement where we are talking more about it um, or at least identifying it? I think one of the things that because, um, maybe we don't take play seriously that it just has a bad um you know it needs some more pr you know because when we're doing some of those other things and we we our activities are playful learning but maybe we're afraid that you know the school principal isn't going to like it if we say we're spending you know an hour doing play um so we don't talk about play but i think the problem with that is that the less we talk about it the less respect it gets and so it becomes this really like downward spiral where you know we disguise the play and say, oh, no, we're learning STEM and we we pretend it's not play um, when in fact it's playful STEM learning. Right. And so sometimes I think because we um, are worried that people don't value it, we disguise the play. And maybe that's important for some time, but then that also then degrades because then that's the first thing people cut. And so what I'd like to do is to say all of us, you know, we are going to do it. We're also going to spend some time talking about it and being more intentional about it so that we elevate the importance of play because it's not helping kids by pretending something is, is math. Um, it can be math and it can be also play. But when we, all, when we kind of keep downplaying the play part, um, I don't think it's actually good for kids or for society or for grownups for that matter. So... I just to say, let's let's all agree, and you're on the call already, and hopefully we can share this recording and share the resources more widely with our networks um, after spring break. Um, but to really think about, you know, how we can be part of the solution, and this is about kids uh, and for adults, you know, for our well-being, for our health, and for the future. So, one more poll, Kelsey. So this one is how confident are you in designing intentional playful learning programs in your work? So it's, I'm very confident, I'm somewhat confident, I am not confident. I'll wait another about 10 seconds. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Um, so, you know, most of you who answered said, you know, you're you're confident or very confident. And again, you're on this webinar. So I know that you already have a lot of knowledge and, and intention. Um, so again, hopefully we'll be able to, I'm sure we'll have time for you to share what you've been doing, what's been successful for you as well. So, I'm going to talk a little just really briefly about the project that we have uh, and then how we've adapted it and made it more um, playful learning using um, sort of a framework. And that is um, our mystery box challenge where you get a, a prompt on the upper left that's age appropriate. You get a box that has some supplies that you can see on the upper, upper, sorry, upper left, um, a castle, and then the supplies. And we actually have kind of a recipe like you need a a, a base, you need a stick, you need um, something colorful, you know, type of thing. Um, and then you have time to, to make it. Uh, and then you um, go back to the educator and you explain what you made and the educator asks open-ended questions for you. So uh, we have the information in the a recipe card. We're going to try to make it better, but if you want to go to the QR code, um, you can uh, get more information on the specific um, mystery box challenge and some of the prompts. Um, 
And what we've done is, is what we mentioned, we um, were selected, invited to join the Lego Playful Learning Museum Network, which is now in its second year. Um, what we did was we were able to get some training by the Lego group and Lego Foundation to actually, you know, apply some of the lessons that they've learned from research. And this is what um, their researchers have found out. Again, they respect the fact that there's lots of different definitions for play. They understand that there's a lot of research on the impacts. And what they've done is they've tried to say, you know, here are some of the elements that make play a playful learning experience. And there's play that is just fun and so on. Um, and all of them can become learning because, you know, it's it's things about, you know, collaboration. It's about critical thinking. There's so many different ways of incorporating it. So they currently, their researchers have not said, do you have to have like two of these five? Do you have to have five to make it effective? You know, what's the sort of degree? They have not prescribed that. I think some of their researchers are interested in looking at that as our researchers at Harvard and all over the United States as well. Um, but but what Lego has suggested is that there are sort of five elements and that if you're able to incorporate some of the incorporate some of these elements, then you have a playful learning um, experience and that will lead to some of those great youth outcomes. And again, some of this is now based, you can actually study brain waves and how neurons are growing and so on during different kinds of activities and which things light up parts of the brains more than others. So there's really some exciting research happening. I'd still rather work with kids than brains kids' brains, I guess. Um, but I'm glad that there's research happening that's really looking at all these things. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these things, and that is, uh, I'm just going to go through what these mean then. Um, so starting with um, uh, the upper left, uh, the, the left is iterative. Um, so iterative um, to, uh, to, to Lego and to others is this idea that um, you can do it multiple times, um, that, you, it, um, that you can improve on something, that you, know, you fiddle with something, and you're able to uh, you know, keep playing it, 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 you know, you get to continue working with it. And over and over again, you're able to sort of grow. And if it is an iterative event, that activity that actually keeps kids wanting to do one more, more and more, that is learning. You know, every time they repeat it, uh, every time they do it, they're learning a new skill or thinking of a new way of problem solving. Um, so it's something that is intentionally designed to be iterative, to allow someone to do it multiple times, to be able to um, improve something through time, um, play a game and get better at it. You know, that's sort of this, this repeatability aspect of it. At the top, meaningful. Um, meaningful to the researchers means that it's relevant to your life, that it is something that um, respects who you are and what, what you come with, um, uh, the assets that you already have, and that it ties to something um, that you feel is relevant, something that is meaningful to your life. Um, to the right, then, is joyful. Um, so again, that's pretty easy to, to think about. It's, it's something that's fun, something that you return to. And one of the things that um, Lego Foundation had worked with us about is thinking about, you know, what are our childhood memories? You know, what are the memories that stuck with us um, year after year? What are those family traditions? Or what did you do as a kid that you really stuck with you? And what are the elements of it? And when you think about, you know, those, those favorite childhood memories, they're they're um, they're full of joy and laughter, but it's not just, you know, it's not just a joke. It's like who told the joke or what was the joke about or what was the setting you were in? So joyfulness um, it does mean happiness and, and so on. We know now that when you're happy, your brain uh, is producing, uh, you know, your body produces hormones that are, that are you know, uh, endorphins and so on. Your brain is making connections and so on. So we know that joy is your body actually reacts to it in a way that um, creates memories and learning and brain connections um, when, when your experiences are joyful. 
Um, the bottom right is socially interactive. So playful, good, playful learning experiences are socially interactive because again, uh, that's where you have communication and collaboration where you're you're thinking about somebody else, the empathy, the social emotional learning. Um, it also keeps you uh, connected to the play. Um, so maybe you stay longer in that playful learning. There's more nuances to the play. Um, it's something you can become iterative. So socially interactive um, provides provides the context for a lot of different kinds of learning, especially social emotional learning, but also provides that stickiness where you want to come back to it. And that's what also makes great play playful learning experiences, something you're going to keep going back to and keep growing from. And the last part is actively engaging. And to me, I end with this one because in some ways it's kind of a, a way to encapsulate a lot of these things because, you know, if it's joyful, it's also probably actively engaging, um, but it doesn't have to be. So actively engaging to me is this idea that, you know, it is so, uh, so immersive that, you know, your kids don't pay attention to anything else. You know, they're not looking for the next YouTube video or, you know, the next uh, kid who comes in the door. They're so immersed in something that they they are, are working on, they want to see it to completion, that, you know, they are painting something there, or they're doing something that it's so immersive to them, um, that they lose track of time, that there's nothing else matters, that they don't want to go on and do something else, they want to be actively engaged. And we know those are the moments where um, you are, are learning in the sense of putting things, new things together, you're able to think something through because you're not distracted, um, but that you want to be actively engaged engaged. Um, and we know that that's, we know that when a kid stays at something and doesn't run off to the next thing, something there is, is meaningful to them. It's giving them joy. Um, it is something that is engaging them whole body and mind. Um, and those are the kind of playful learning and memories that we all have as well. So to me, this is a lot easier to sort of be a checklist. So if I'm designing an activity in the museum or trying to improve an exhibit, for example, we try to go through these and not everything can be this way. Um, but at the same time, we want to know, did we intentionally try to do these things? You know, does this uh, provide a smile on someone's face or is it, you know, meant to be serious? It's OK, you know, but let's at least decide that we're, uh, you know, that we're not going to actively pursue this element of playful learning um, or is there a chance to incorporate it and does that make the um, the exhibit more uh, more successful um, does it help that does it you know not um, overcomplicate the experience that actually it's too complicated now because we've tried to do five things and so it's a way to sort of be a checklist of um, you know intentionality and say you know could we tweak it does it make sense to tweak it more or is this something that can't happen in this exhibit but we want to put it in this exhibit so that you know the museum as a whole is providing all five of these so I think that's one way you can look at at your day um, with kids, um, your class or your camp, you know, in five days, summer camp, you know, are we doing all five of these things? Are one of these, are there activities that do all five? Are there some that are missing some here? Do we want to be able to, you know, have a sort of rhythm to the week so that we're accomplishing all five of these so that we know the week is, is going to be playful learning, um, but not every element needs to be. So I think it's just a way to just keep us grounded and accountable and make sure that we really are um, trying to pass back in as much as we can, um, again, because we know that by from the research that these are what allows there to be play that also leads to learning as well. So again, back to the sort of the, the mystery box challenge, some of the things that we've been working with other children's museums and Kelsey has been leading this, but also at our own place is thinking about, you know, what are what are prompts that might be a little bit more meaningful than just a castle? And it might be harder for younger kids because you're you're not doing anything, you know, as complicated and, and so on. Um, but then again, there are some things that are really meaningful to, to kids. Um, so thinking about like, how do we ask kids? How do we ask parents, you know, what are more meaningful 
meaningful prompts that are not so abstract. Um, what are, you know, for older kids, I think it's easier to think about, you know, um, more like service learning. And those of you are familiar with how kids learn and um, the learning in after school and summer principles. And there's a lot about service learning and for, for older children and thinking about that, that meaningful and relevant work to them could be something about social environmental justice, looking at, you know, what's in their neighborhood, what would they want to improve in the lives of their neighbors in their community. Um, those are the kinds of things that we are looking at saying, you know what, to be more playful learning and be more relevant and to really address inequities, you know, how do we give voice to children uh, and youth uh, and that prompts might be an easy way to do that. So that's just one example of when we started looking at an, at an activity that we love and that we're very proud of, but we thought, you know what, we could do better, you know, using those principles, let's look at meaningful. I think that's the one that to me, we need to do more, challenge ourselves to do better in. Um, you know, I think that it's it's generally engaging, it's iterative. Some kids do many, many of these, you know, prompts. Um, so again, not that nothing else can be improved, but you know, I, I look at those five principles and I it, it really then opens my eyes. I can't unsee it. You know, once I once I know that we could be more meaningful in this activity, it is something that I have to strive for, you know. And I think that that's one of the things that that framework can allow you to do to sort of look at incremental change and how to improve, always strive for more quality and more playful learning um, for our kids. And that leads to the learning in after school and summer. Uh, and I am such a big fan of this. Uh, when I was at the Coalition for Science after school, I carried around postcards and flyers and so on. I still do. I still have posters uh, and uh, I still have postcards. Uh, I gave one to Kelsey. I, I really believe um, that this is, again, a very similar thing. And and what I want to say is that, you know, these frameworks are match match up. They're, they're not in conflict. They're, of course, because they're based on kids and they're based on research, uh, so they're not in conflict. Um, but for example, if we look at you know those the what you, the the play, the seven powers, you know the active part or leads directly to the coordination and physical activity and hand-eye coordination and gross motor skills. Um, collaborative is is clearly uh, was one of the things in the seven powers, but it's also the socially interactive. Um, meaningful, again, in learning and after school and in the Lego five principles, you know, exactly the same, that kids are going to be more engaged and learn more. It'll be more um, impactful for their own lives if we give them meaningful activities. The more meaningful, the better. Um, supports mastery. Um, to me, that's a really important for one in the learning and after school and summer principles because that's what builds confidence. You know, mastery means you get better and better at something. Um, not only is that good for your skills and practice, but it's also good for your own, uh, your own confidence, your own agency. So supporting mastery, I think, is really important. And that could be found in a few of the Lego things. Maybe it's about iterative you know, maybe it's about actively engaging. Um, there's different ways of, of looking at that. So again, these are not in conflict. I, I like the fact that there's some things that you know, clearly use the same word like meaningful. And there's other ones that make you think like, you know, how does a playful learning support mastery? And also how does the support mastery principle manifest itself in those principles? Um, the expanding horizons one is is always been sort of my favorite in the learning and after school and summer because I feel like that's what what summer camp after school museums do you know kids have to do well in school they have to stay in school they have to learn things in school and school is important for that and I'm glad they do it there so I don't have to do it in the museum because the museum is about expanding horizons it's about exploring things that they can't do in school it's about being good at something else that doesn't get a grade in it's about talking to people who they would never talk to in school it's about you know families seeing each other the diversity the languages that you hear in a museum or an after school program that you don't hear in school you know all of those things are expanding horizons since to me um the playful learning if we think about how that expands horizons that's such a powerful way so how do we do a game that comes from another culture or how do we you know share a game that says you know look this is a similar game but this is how everybody plays it in different ways you know we you know it's it's even something ridiculous to me like you know using the same, same different words for the same thing you know I think that shows that, you know something about culture and about diversity and so on so how do we sort of look at that you know is that sort of just in the socially interactive part it could also be in the meaningful part when you're expanding her your horizons um and 
and it relates to you know your your grandparents culture you know that's meaningful as well so there's all these different ways of looking at these so again i'm not saying we should all be you know compartmentalized and all these different frameworks i'm saying let's look at how these frameworks really reinforce each other and it's it's about kids learning and there's different ways and different approaches um, but taking these different lenses allows us to create these richer settings and richer um, experiences so that kids can get sort of this this thing that they can't get um, in in one place at home or at school you know how do we sort of integrate these and give them the skills to succeed in life Another one that I want to do a little bit of a crosswalk on, again, I'm a huge advocate for the learning and after school and summer principles that have become, you know, California um, standards as well for expanded learning. Um, but another example is, is looking at um, the um, is Psy Girls, which is from um, a PBS show, but they've created this toolkit um, and I have the QR code for that, that is about how you take um, uh, existing STEM activities and how to make sure that they are welcoming to all kids, including uh, including and especially girls. Um, and of course, we all know that if you think about inclusivity for any dimension, um, but what is good for girls is also good for boys. So it's not at the expense of boys. It's thinking that, you know, trying to break the stereotype of what a typical boy in STEM would do and think about it in 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 a broader way um so here again if you look at the the meaningful um ways to engage girls in stem so many of these can also be rooted not only in the learning and after school and summer principles but also in these principles for for play as well so clearly connecting stem experiences to girls lives that's the meaningful part um, supporting girls using stem practices um that could be for example a uh, I guess, you know, that's more the LIAS that's a, about, you know, supporting mastery, for example, but, you know, it could be actively engaging, for example, um, empowering girls to embrace struggles, you know, that's the idea about, you know, having a, you know, growth mindset, for example, um, and that could be iterative, for example, so that, you know, when you, you, you struggle with it, but you keep doing it, and then you're able to build something. Um, so I think that these are, again, ways to sort of look at this and say, you know, how does it apply to the principles? How how do these things also reinforce the powers of play? So emphasizing that STEM is collaborative and community oriented clearly ties to um, the social aspect, the socially interactive, as well as to um, the seven powers of play about sort of communication and collaboration. So again, I'm just trying to say, you know, we have lots of frameworks in our lives, you know, um, from our organization, from, you know, funding sources and so on, and, and also really research-based practices. And what they're saying is that there's a few threads that go through here. Um, and so I hope that these are reinforcing and not, again, just like, oh my gosh, there's another set of five principles I've got to follow. So I don't think that's the, the um, that's ever been what, you know, people wanted everyone to feel. Like, you know, this is uh, a, a recipe that you can't, um, that you can't, you know, break from. This is a way to sort of make things richer and, and, and more uh, nutritious um, for the kids in our lives. So I'm going to pause here again and to ask um, uh, if there's any questions or things you want to share, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And then meanwhile, Kelsey, I think this is our last poll for today. So it's just a question is like, which of the five characteristics of play um, is most exciting to you? Meaningful, joyful, iterative, actively engaging, socially interactive? Is there one that really spoke to you? Okay, I'm gonna... Uh, and again, feel free to put anything in the chat. I'm going to give it a couple more seconds. Okay. Okay, we can end poll then. Um, so it was pretty evenly split among um, among the respondents then. So actively engaging, 
uh, and joyful and meaningful um, were the ones that are the most meaningful to, to each of us. Um, it's interesting that we didn't put socially interactive, maybe because it's so baked into so much of what we do already, for example. Um, and maybe because it's Friday, we want joyful today. <laughs> I'm just glad that you're all actively engaged today. So thank you for that. Okay. So we are going to um, get into more of the workshoppy part uh, where we're going to actually, I'm going to actually talk about some of the specific um, strategies you could use. And then I will, uh, if you want to prepare, you know, bring something that you'd like to share an activity you'd like to, uh, you can either propose an activity that you'd like us to strategize for you about or something that you've struggled with, or something that you've done, we'd love to hear from you as well, if you wanted to, to share that at the end, and we'll have some time for that. So we're going to go to strategies now. Um, and so I think for the strategies, then to me, I've sort of bucketed it into three things. And then one is really the designing the activities parts that we're going to do. Um, but also a little bit about, you know, what the adults can do, um, the practitioners. So it could be you, but it could be your team. You know, how do we get them to feel comfortable doing these things? And then I do really want to talk a little bit about time because I think um, one of the things in after school, you know, we're trying to do so much or a museum visit, you know, we're, we have so much in common, the museum and the after school, you know, we have 90 minutes or an hour, you know, with, with kids and they're doing other things, you know, at the same time, um, how to do these things. I do think that the time is a barrier um, and something that we need to to focus more on is instructional. If we're even the best activities and the best practitioners aren't going to be able to accomplish what we want if there's not enough time for play. So I do want to sort of end with, with that piece as well. So uh, let me, so we talked about, well, you know, we can talk more about, and um, well, we talked a lot about activities already, but, you know, how to incorporate those. But let me talk a little bit about sort of adult practice. Because I do think one of the challenges has been um, that, um, you know, sometimes it's hard for parents and practitioners to kind of get silly or, you know, to not feel totally bored when they're children playing with their children. So I, I think that, um, you know, and this is natural, this is normal, uh, but I think it is a barrier in terms of, you know, how we make sure um, children get enough play. So one of the things, is, as you heard from the introduction, you know, I was a program officer um, at a family foundation, and one of the things we funded uh, quite a bit on um, was character development and social emotional learning in after school. And we commissioned a study that looked at research and said, you know, what are the practices that help kids grow up to be good people, you know, uh, and, and with compassion and empathy and, and those leadership and so on. And it turns out one of the key things is whether the adults, the coaches, the swim instructors, the camp uh, educators, you know, after school practitioners, you know, whether the adults reflected on their own character and reflected on their own role as role models. That if adults just remembered that um, they were role models and kids were looking up to them, that kids were going to tell them their secrets, that kids um, wanted to make them proud. If adults could, could reflect on that and think about like, what in my life this week did I do to practice compassion? Just the fact that the adults reflected and cared about their own social emotional learning and their role in the lives of the children they saw, that made a difference for kids. And so you could do all the training, all the curriculum purchases and so on, but the adults didn't care and the adults didn't think about themselves, it wasn't going to work. So that's why when Megan said, you know, working with adults, I was so excited because that's actually part of this is that if we don't work on ourselves, if we don't work on the other staff, we could structure, make them play Monopoly all day long. And it still isn't going to make as much difference as if uh, when the adults really thought about, you know, I played a game this week. I got frustrated with the rules. You know, I had to make up my own rules or, you know, I saw my friend cheated in soccer, you know, this weekend or I lost a lot of money on poker in Vegas. 
Vegas. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, if we don't reflect on sort of our own play and our own skills and our own practice and how that translates to the kids in our lives, you know, we we also can't do this as well. So I don't know if I have any research to back that up. It's just um, based on what I, what the research shows in sort of social emotional learning. This is, I think, something that I would think about, you know, that um, we've got to learn to play. We've got to get, let loose and we've got to say that, you know what, having fun is actually really important. <laughs> it's important to our own well-being and even for our profession. So I think getting adults to practice play and reflecting on the importance of play and fun in our own lives helps us when we think about making time for kids. If we value in our own life, we should try to make time in our own kids at home and at work. Another thing that I think because of the thing about being silly sometimes is one suggestion I have is that, you know, on your team, for example, you assign somebody that role that day, you know, today you are going to be a kid and you're going to play on the playground as a kid and you're not going to be the monitor for that day. So, you know, somebody else is playing the monitor and you get to play. Right. So this idea that um, if you if someone is assigned the job of today, you are the you play with kids and that is your job. I think it might allow a practitioner to take off their other hats, you know, like, um, you know, I also have to monitor the door, but I also have to, like, enforce rules and safety. If somebody else plays safety monitor and you get to be just a kid at play with the rest of the kids, that might free you up to be silly, to you know not monitor and give them rules as that you follow their rules for the day. So I wonder whether sort of uh, allowing us to not always multitask and to say you are the assigned player for this this session might free us up a little bit to uh, to actually um, put play into practice. Another one, of course, is to just say, you know, let the kids decide on the rules. You know, maybe it's a little chaotic, you know, maybe it, it doesn't have a winner at the end, but they came up with the rules and let's, let's, we just step out of it and being intentional about it. So either deciding that we're going to set up the rules and let them play, or we are going to be a play in the game, whatever it is with them as a peer, or whether we're going to step back and be absent that day. I think those are three different modes of, of playful learning, three different modes of work. And we should just be intentional about it and decide and not try to muddle all the roles all the time. And that's just one suggestion, uh, a couple of suggestions in terms of how to help the adults um, actually implement playful learning in a way that might be more effective for the kids. You know, they're, they're going to get more out of it if we know what our roles are for the day. Another um, a structural thing, as I mentioned, is sort of the making time. So I think that, you know, research does show that it takes at least 20 minutes for grownups and kids to get in the flow or um, to, to be immersed in something. So the part about the actively engaged, you know, there again, there are studies that show that it takes 20 minutes for kids to if you let kids have free play, it takes about 20 minutes for them to construct the game and all the rules. You know, they have to negotiate all these things, right? So, you know, you're going to play this and I'm going to play this and this is out of bounds and, you know, this is a point. This is 10 points. You know, it takes time to set that up. And if you interrupt them before they actually get to play the game, they're going to be mad, right? As you know, pick up time. So that's one of the things I think is really hard for after school programs. A lot of times you do the homework, you do the snack and then but and then the STEM activity. And then by the time you get to you know pick up time is when you actually do play. And that's where kids get so upset, right? One kid has to leave and you didn't finish the game. And now the rest of the kids are mad and the kid who left is crying. And, you know, so, so I think if we believe in play, we've got to put our put our time where our mouth is. You know, we, we got to put our money where our mouth is. We got to actually make time for it. And I would suggest that obviously the longer, the better. But I think anything less than 20 minutes, again, from the research perspective, shows that that will be 
uh, not effective. And in fact, you know, it'll interrupt and maybe be destructive, you know, because then they never did finish. There was never a conclusion to that. So allowing time, even in pretend play, again, sometimes we think of oh, pretend play, you know, they're just playing princesses. What's the big deal? But no, because they just negotiate who was the princess. It took them 15 minutes to figure out who was a princess and who was the maid, right? So, you know, now you're telling them they got to go home. So 20 minutes to construct, uh, to have a construct, to set up the rules, to actually play it, and then to have some sort of conclusion or, or, or to have some sort of a way to either continue it or, or something that you're getting in the flow. Again, 20 minutes. Flow is this idea for adults where uh, if you're painting or writing or or doing lots of different gardening, you know, that um, it takes about 20 minutes again to this flow state where nothing can interrupt you, where you're so absorbed and you are joyful. Your brain is working at a different way. Um, flow is really a biological um, and emotional state and creative state. That's where artists and creative people say they, that's where the best ideas come from. That's where the inspiration really manifests itself. So again, if you want to get into that, you're going to need some time. And then this distraction free, and that's what I mentioned about the pickup time. I, again, I think it's very challenging. I don't think that it's easy. Um, again, that's why I think play has gotten kind of a bad rap or not enough dedications. People think it's super easy. You know, it's, it, you don't have to have anything, you know, know, paper, to toilet paper rolls and they can play. And that might be true, but you still need to set it up so that there's time and there's a reason that's meaningful and so on uh, to be able to do it. So it's, it's not as easy as people think it is. It might be natural for kids, but playful learning to make it really um, do the kinds of things um, that we think it can do. And for kids to feel like they have ownership of that playtime takes structural design to make it work. So I'll pause here and see if there's any questions. And then we're going to do a couple exercises and sort of seeing how we can take a playful a play activity and make it playful learning. And then we'll, again, allow you all to share. So are there any questions? You could either unmute yourself or put your question in chat. You ready to take on a couple activities maybe? There's still time, so just go ahead and feel free to put chat anytime. And again, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Okay. So, and again, if people want to do this, you are welcome to uh, to unmute or raise your hand or put it into chat. So we're gonna take tic-tac-toe. And we're going to overanalyze it right now. <laughs> we're going to overanalyze tic-tac-toe. And just right now, it's thinking about the seven powers of play that came from the Minnesota uh, Children's Museum. Um, thinking about these things, you know, let's go through and say, you know, does tic-tac-toe and how could you, you know, how does this relate? So taking a really simple game doesn't take 20 minutes to play tic-tac-toe. Um, and sort of practicing how we would look at um, the outcomes for tic-tac-toe. How does that sound? Okay. Oh, so, okay. So for creative thinking, um, maybe this isn't the one that's, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, impact here. Um, but um, when you've seen young children play, you know, they get pretty creative with tic-tac-toe, don't they? You know, and they're experimenting with alternatives, you know, by now we know, you know, like this is a loser, right? The, after the first move, adults know like this is a loser for me, right? <laughs> or like I'm going to win this one, right? But for a kid, they don't know yet. So actually, you know, it, even with this, there is some creative thinking, there's analysis and there's critical thinking, right? So thinking about... um, uh, You know, what is your next move? What is the goal? How do you experiment? And it Again, it is you experiment without fear and it's low stakes, right? So you can play lots and lots of rounds of tic-tac-toe um, when you're a kid and you are exploring the possibilities. The critical thinking and the social emotional learning to me is, is again, where you start recognizing patterns. But I think that's also this interesting part about like, um, what do you think the other person's going to do? 
you know, I do think that that's critical thinking, right? Can you predict what they're going to do? So, I mean, this is the first step, you know, people talk about, the, about chess, you know, you have to think about 10 steps in, in advance. Well, tic-tac-toe is the same thing. You're just thinking two steps in advance, but you're trying to figure out if I put this here, where is that other person going to put it, right? Um, if they put it here, are they trying to trick me into, you know, putting my X here or, you know, what is that next step? So, um, again, tic-tac-toe is fast, but it, and it's simple and it's just a pencil and paper or, you know, drawing on sand. Um, and yet it creates, you know, a setting where there's low stakes, critical thinking, um, creative thinking, trying to understand different steps and trying to understand what your opponent is going to do. What are they thinking? So self-control, uh, again, it, you know, it could be, you know, winning or losing, uh, I just remember being frustrated about losing a tic-tac-toe. You know, I, I just, it's like one of these things, you know, like, um, you know, like uh, my dad would just like to beat us on it, you know, so, and we were just so gullible, you know, thinking we were going to win the next time, but, you know, and sometimes you win though. So this self-control, you know, like, even if I got mad about it, I still remember, you know, I'm still playing it with him, right? So uh, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you, you're going to persevere, for example, and so on. Um, there is a uh, confidence. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you win and you, you see the pattern, you know, there is something about really being excited about it. Um, collaboration, uh, you know, again, maybe there's not so much here, but there is trying to understand what the other person's trying to do, uh, you know, not cheating. Maybe you still have to decide on who's X and who's O, you know, so there's a little bit of collaboration and communication there. Um, and then coordination, you know, so for example, thinking about, um, you know, again, holding a pencil and paper or holding a token, you know, even in a tic-tac-toe, there is a little a bit of uh, hand-eye coordination and, and physical coordination that actually is, is necessary. So again, something we don't normally think about, um, but it's something that is there. Who else has an idea about tic-tac-toe? I could share one. Good. I like to use tic-tac-toe. Well, I, it's the version of my own version of it when um, with language learning. So putting and on the board and having a vocabulary word in each of the squares. And then the, the students will choose a vocabulary word. And if they define it correctly or they, or do if we're doing bilingual Spanish, English, then they get to put their letter or their initial or whatever symbol they want to represent them. And then we play tic-tac-toe that way. So using it to build language. That is awesome. That is, that's super awesome. I'm going to try that next time. You could do it with foreign language and oh, I could see lots of lots of uh, ways to, to use that. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to share about tic-tac-toe? Of course, now I've made all the parents feel bad when they they beat their kids, right? <laughs> you can't pull punches either, right? Then they don't learn anything. <laughs> okay, so let's do the same thing then for hide and seek. So it, does anybody want to analyze hide and seek? Anyone interested in taking a stab at it? I definitely see the creative thinking and the critical thinking, right? Because you're like trying to hide <laughs> in a spot where you're trying to like think of where the other person would guess where you are and also where you'll fit. And you're trying to do it within this like time constraint. So you're like, you're standing there and you have this like list in your head of all of these things that you need to check out off before you like find your spot. That's right. And definitely a little bit of self-control, you know, you have to stay there and don't move, you know, even if they're close by, you know, um, there's always a kid who has to run out, right? For some reason, right? So you have got to hold, hold on. That's the kid um, who's not confident in his choice. <laughs> right. I think it's the next piece. <laughs> yes, his confidence that they're not going to catch you, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was also going to add on to the self-control. I see my nephew um, when we're playing the self-control to be counting and not peak. So to not cheat and follow that rule. 
Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that is a really good one, actually. <laughs> Which is, you know, part of this collaboration thing, you know, like you have to play by the rules, right? <laughs> Um, and that's actually, um, uh, you know, the, their definition about, you know, sort of the pursue the common goal, because if everyone cheats all the time, the game falls apart, right? Then nobody wants to play with you next time and so on. So there's a lot of the, those elements of social emotional learning, you know, when I think and that's why I really think games, you know, it's it's a social construct. Uh, so is life, you know, and so thinking about, you know, you figure out, yeah, how much do cheaters get away with and, you know, all those things. But instead of like making a moral judgment on it, you're just playing a game, right? <laughs> Other thoughts about hide and seek? I think this is also one where there's some, you know, negotiation, like, you know, there's always, uh, just like Cece said about the, you know, the, the sort of um, peaking and, but, you know, you have to decide like what you're going to count to, right? Or like, where are the boundaries? So a lot of the games break down, right? When a kid goes out of the boundary and they're like, that's not fair. We said that was out of bounds. And like, no, you didn't, right? So there is actually quite a lot of negotiation in some of these games, uh, you know, in, in again, these, these playful things. So I'm wondering now, um, it's 11.26 and we have time for you all to either, if you want to uh, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute, or you know, do you have a uh, current activity you want us to help with or one that you've been tackling and you've been incorporating new things? We'd love to hear some of your thoughts and your um, and, and challenges. Anyone interested in sharing? You don't have to really, I, we get it. It's again, it's spring break and it's Friday. We love the fact that you're here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let us know too. We can always definitely help you with that. Um, and I've shared a little bit about how we're taking an activity, which we already loved and thought, oh, you know, once we, once we thought about it in spring work, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't ignore it anymore. You know, it starts to like grate at you because you're, again, you're trying to be more intentional about it. And, and once you use this, so, um, you know, hopefully this and, and other frameworks will allow you to think about what are the outcomes and also what are the elements that you would want to incorporate more to make those, you know, limited playtime with kids even more meaningful than they ever have been. So then I'll just end now then uh, with a few more slides. It's just how do we all inspire a play movement? So, you know, what, you know, I, I know that because you called in today, you've already been doing training in this, you're thinking about it, you've designed, you feel confident um, that we all know that this is important for kids. And I'm sure all of us feel frustrated sometimes where, you know, you either, again, like either are hiding it behind other content or, you know, you're not talking about it to parents and to principals. And again, this idea that if we keep hiding it, it may, we can't change things as quickly. And so, um, you know, I've used this example before of like chocolate covered broccoli, you know, like maybe, yeah, you can get your kids to eat the broccoli by covering it in cinnamon and chocolate and, you know, sugar. But at some point, um, they're going to need to know that it was broccoli because otherwise it's not going to change their diet. It's not going to change their preferences or their ideas. Once they see a broccoli without sugar on it, you know, they're not going to eat it. And so you've not made systemic change. And so for me, it's the same thing. If we all, if we always just pretend it's something else, at least the kids are getting play. Totally agree. It's still better than, than, you know, letting the kids suffer. Right. So if that's how you need to get play into your day, go, go for it. But if you're able to do anything to move the needle, that's going to be a much bigger societal change for those of us who, uh, you know, those of our educators who aren't brave enough to be able to, to, to like raise their hand and say we're doing play. So I want to just end by talking a little bit about how to raise awareness and to say that, you know, 
um, parents do value play. So uh, in, in studies, uh, recent studies, you know, 98%, I should say, of parents, of parents say they believe that play helps children reach their full potential. And they specifically say it's in skill development, educational. And you know what, despite what we hear in the news, parents do care about social emotional impact. Even if that's not the language, even if it's character, I know that it's controversial in a lot of states right now. But the reality is that most teacher, most parents do think that they want their kids to be good people, that they want them to learn social and emotional skills, and uh, and they actually think that it helps them be a better person. So, you know, um, parents do care about this, and they want the best for their kids, and they recognize that play is part of this. And so that 82% of parents do say that children who play more will be more successful in higher education and future work. So I think sometimes when we think that, you know, we're more afraid than maybe we should be, that parents do believe in it. And maybe they just don't think that after school or schools are the place. That's why I'm so lucky to be in a museum and why I, it's easy for me to talk about because I'm at a museum where people know they're going to come to play. Um, so it's easy for me to say, and I totally get that. Um, and what I want to help all of you who may have a harder time is that, you know, parents do value it. If we talk about the learning that comes from it, even principals uh, and funders might like it as well, um, that there can be a, a movement. And there are lots of people who think like you do, who want play, even if we're all talking about it in different ways. And we all want the best for kids. So talk about it, you know, talk about play, sometimes use the word. Um, if you have to use playful learning um, it, and play to learn uh, is a, as a way to sort of get that uh, people to understand it's that it's uh, play. Um, it's also learning, um, but it's learning life skills. You know, it's not necessarily learning facts and figures, it, although it can be like we talked about um, language, literacy, and so on. It's also so much more than that. It's about how to navigate the world. It's about how to you know, find your place in the world and all those things that we believe in, in after school and summer camp and museums and, and out of school learning um, and in school learning. You know, this is this is what can encapsulate it. And, uh, and, you know, my suggestion with presenting some of these free resources and frameworks is just giving you some more language and frameworks to look at it, things that are research based where you don't have to know all the details, um, but that there are some frameworks and, and lessons that you can um, use and words and that you know that these are meaningful to kids. And we already do this and we're giving you a little bit more power in what you do and to be able to communicate it with others. So with that, um, I just did want to say that it will be this uh, will be on uh, YouTube and there's a lot of great videos. For example, we do encourage you to look at the kindness one because uh, it relates so much to what we just talked about. Um, but there's there's so many um, uh, great resources and this will be up there as well. And when it's up there, um, hopefully you'll be able to um, share it with your colleagues. And again, when we email you, we'll send you a copy of the um, of the PowerPoint as well as links to those free resources for, for you to use as well. And with that, we'll, we'll be happy to take any questions or again, anything that you've been doing that you'd like to share today, we'd, we'd love to hear from you today or uh, in the, in the future as well. Any thoughts? Good. Okay. Well, we'll end it officially there, but Kelsey and I will stay on for a few more minutes. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll stay on for a couple more minutes if anybody wants to just hang out for a little bit. Um, but again, appreciate, you know, having a, a bunch of like-minded people to help kids, you know, get a get more fun and, and learning in their lives. So thank you so much. And we'll hang out and otherwise you'll see us um, on, on YouTube shortly. Yes, thank you so much to our speaker, Dr. Carol Tang, for her wonderful webinar today. Um, you can visit the How Kids Learn YouTube channel to watch past webinars, share it with your staff, and then, of course, stay tuned for more webinars from the Temescal Associates and the How to Learn Foundation. Carol and I will hang out here. Um, if you have to run, feel free to email either of us with any questions you may have. And thank you all so much for taking time today. Happy weekend. Thank you.
Hi, Ronnie. Thanks for joining. Hello, Sam. Let's see if I can unmute. Hello. Hi, Hi Carol. Thank Hello. you so much. This was, and Kelsey, um, so informative and, and really put together this notion of play and things that I have done in the past that weren't necessarily structured with adults, um, but it just gives me a whole new perspective. So thank you both for this very informative and, and engaging uh, conversation, Good, presentation. Yes. And I know I had some emails of people who would love to see it uh, when it's uh, on YouTube as well. So, um, so Sam, thank you for putting this together. Uh, thank you for being patient with our sort of nudging the uh, the webinar to a little bit more of a workshop and less of the traditional speakers forum. So, thanks for your patience and tolerance on on that as well. So, thank you. Good. I think everybody's off then. Um, and mm -hmm. you've stopped recording, right? Oh, we have Miss Janine on, is on. I don't know if she wanted to. I don't know. I can stop recording. I just want to make sure I don't miss any questions. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to end the meeting. I don't know how to. Yes. I'll do it. Okay, here we go. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>